an illuminating history bearing on the everlasting struggle for cartoon supremacy fought between the powers of studio heads and artists. Insert explosion clip here. Uh. Hello, and welcome to Bomb Squad Movie Nights. I'm your host for his first time on Movie Nights, new rebrand name, Ethan Hawker. And with me, I have... Hi, I'm Austin Zwiebelman. Tim M. Sullivan. And today, we are once again diving into the wild and wonderful world of auteur animator Ralph Bakshi after covering his debut feature, Fritz the Cat, uh, earlier this year. Uh, this time, we'll be discussing his first foray into feature filmmaking for families, you know, open quotes, <laughs> with the 1977 post-apocalyptic science fantasy film, Wizards. Going into this with you guys, especially since... Um, I know I don't think Austin's seen Wizards, but he's seen a couple of Bakshi's earlier urban films, and, and Tim is more familiar with Wizards. What was your guys' history with, for those who have a history, and expectations uh, going into Wizards, uh, both for the first time and, and this time? Austin, let's start with you. You're completely right, Ethan. I had no prior history with Wizards before this viewing, none whatsoever. Uh, my brief examination of its Wikipedia article <laughs> told me that it's Bakshi's first go to PG-rated feature in the beginning of his uh, Sword and Sorcerer output. I've only seen Fritz the Cat and Heavy Traffic, so I had no prior conception whatsoever of what a PG-rated fantasy Bakshi picture would look like. So in short, I was going into this fairly blind. Yeah, that's completely fair. Uh, like, if, especially seeing his earlier films, it's uh, difficult to kind of gauge exactly how he would handle that material. I feel like it ends up feeling very Bakshi, so, so distinct, maybe not quite what you would expect from someone, especially coming off the, those earlier films, but there's still a lot of his, his signature flourishes, uh, such as they are. I don't want to rule this planet, my lord. Just our kingdom is enough. Enough? Enough for mutants to stay in their place, huh? Live with radiation so our bodies crawl with hell. Tim, history with slash expectations going into Wizards. Um, so I think the first time I watched this, like, I think my mom had TCM playing at some point and, like, just kind of wasn't really paying attention to what was on the screen. I just kind of passed by it and saw this thing playing and it looked interesting. So I like hit record for the DVR and then ended up watching it later. And I, I've seen a, a couple of Bakshi's movies. I still haven't seen Heavy Traffic, but obviously I've seen Fritz the Cat because we talked about that one earlier. And I've seen Fire and Ice and I've seen American Pop. So I did think that this was kind of an interesting one. It's sort of a blend of sort of his different styles going into some of his other movies, but I'll get more into that later. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my expectations going into it when I first watched it were, I knew that it was a classic, like, fantasy animated thing, and I had seen Fire and Ice before having watched it, so, like, I knew who made it going into it. So, you know, just seemed interesting. I don't know. Back to you, Ethan. Yeah, no, um, I completely agree uh, with it just kind of seeming interesting, like conceptually, there's not a lot of films that blend genre in quite that way, uh, particularly from this time period, you know, a fantasy film in, in a, you know, pre-Star Wars, even if ultimately only a couple weeks film that's a blend of, you know, fantasy and science fiction, like in a dystopian setting, but it's not like a Logan's Run kind of thing, like it's true blue, like fantasy cropping in with the science fiction. They've killed Fritz! They've killed Fritz! Those lousy, stinking yellow fairies! Those horrible, atrocity Bill vermin! For me, I first learned about this film when I was looking at the Wikipedia article for the video game Fallout 3. Huh? Yeah, Fallout 3. Uh, so like m like most people with an Xbox 360 at age 11, uh, I thought Fallout 3 was the bee's knees. I loved Oblivion. So I was reading the Wikipedia article. You know, there's a section for promotion and it mentions the uh, post-apocalyptic film festival, which was, you know, they did a um, series of screenings of post-apocalyptic films uh, like Damnation Alley and Boy and His Dog. That's actually how I learned about those films and would eventually see them. Uh, Boy and His Dog, I've, I have a particular amount of affection for. But uh, Wizards, I remember reading the synopsis for and thinking, wow, uh, that sounds really cool 
cool and I wouldn't see it for a while. So I had a, kind of had it to marinate in my brain. Like I didn't really look into it further outside of, you know, I saw the poster and read the synopsis um, and that sort of distinctive blend of science fantasy and dystopic sort of fiction was there pretty firmly planted. And then around a year later, I want to say um, I was channel surfing late at night. It was probably 11 p.m. midnight and I stumble on it on the Fox movie channel um, of all things where the same place I used to watch marathons of Planet of the Apes. Truly a cultural ground of great cult science fiction junk for me for some reason. I probably missed like the first 10 or 15 minutes of it, but like I watched it for a minute and I'm like, oh wait, is that movie? Is that movie I read about? And I, I, I kind of loved it. Like it sort of immediately caught me off guard and had a lot of really cool ideas. And I eventually, like shortly after, I would rent it from the library because they had a DVD copy of it and I would watch it in full. Since then, it's a movie I come back to a lot. Uh, I used to, back when I was TAing for Jim Tudor, uh, this was the Bakshi film we showed because it's, it's sort of like Tim said, it's an intersection of his urban and his fantasy stuff. Like two trains barreling into each other, resulting in a beautiful, wonderful train wreck. <laughs> My opinion of it has, has changed a little bit, um, in case that isn't obvious, that it isn't just blind love anymore. It's complicated, and I want to get into that in, in more detail, because I think it's, it's a wonderful mess of a movie, but there's nuance there. My mission, oh lord, is to save the world from another holocaust. Sometimes, being a wizard is only at the top. Before I go into any further details myself, uh, let's talk about our overall thoughts of the film. Uh, Tim, would you like to give your overall opinion? It's an interesting, yeah, like intersection of his different styles. Like you have a lot of rotoscope animation blending in with that sort of like traditional cartoon animation. And it feels very experimental in that way, which I find interesting. It's a very big, just like melting pot of like visual and aesthetic styles. I find that very interesting. It feels like somebody started a and d campaign and then just threw some Warhammer 40k pieces on there. I say confidently as someone who has played neither of these games. Yeah, I, I really enjoy it. I think it's a very unique entry in the Bakshi canon, at least as far as I have ventured. And uh, one thing that I really did appreciate on this viewing especially is kind of the way they paint Black Wolf's character. I think something that's lost on a lot of like modern media is irredeemably evil villains. Because like nowadays you make a movie, uh, you, you're in your villain, you kind of have to make him like a tragic, layered, complicated character with shades of gray. This mother was evil from the womb. This mother was just Hitler with magic. Voldemort, but stronger, if you will. <laughs> and, and like looking at like evil people in real life, they're usually in a lot of cases like that because they were brought up from a position of privilege. It's not always the like a bad thing happened to them and now they do bad things. It's, it's they're bad because they have no moral compass. And like, I think that that's interesting to see, but. Attention, leaders of tomorrow's master race. Beyond that, like, I, I just think it's kind of a charming, endearing movie in a lot of ways. Like, you gotta love sort of that uh, harsh divide between Avatar and uh, Nightwolf or Black Wolf, whatever the guy's name is. I love how the, the good guy's just like this little gnomey wizard guy and then his brother's just like edgy McEdgelord. Who, who, who doesn't love two wizards in their final battle? Good guy just pulls out a gun and shoots him. Uh, it's, it's so good. Like, brother, there is no need for me to destroy you. Surrender. I want to show you a trick mother showed me when you weren't around. One more thing. I'm glad you changed your last name, you son of a bitch. There's this meme of a wizard pointing a gun and going, here's a magic trick for you. I'm about to show you God. And that's basically <laughs> how this movie ends. Yeah, that's that's my general thoughts. I'll, I'll come back with more later. Back to you, Ethan. No, I completely get that. Black Wolf is, is a delightful villain. Um, and that ending, yeah, uh, sort of carrying on, we were discussing briefly Kermit impressions, and I know that image you're talking about because it's an image of Kermit with a wizard's hat asking the viewer if they're ready to, to meet God, um, and it's delightful. Um, 
But no, I, I love that finale. It's great, uh, especially considering he purportedly Avatar's character is based off Columbo, and it's basically a Columbo one more thing. Uh, but he whips out a gun and shoots who he's talking to. Knowing about Peter Falk and having that knowledge going into this viewing added a lot uh, to Avatar's characterization. I couldn't figure it out. Suddenly, I thought of something. Um, I appreciated him more, beauted out some of the, the skeevier aspects of the character in a fun way. Uh, but Austin, uh, your overall thoughts on the film? I don't know if this is sort of a trend, but I'm less familiar with the movie at this point in my life and a lot more lukewarm on it than you guys are. Uh, I guess with the other two Bakshi films I've seen, I grew sort of accustomed to the radical adult-oriented content. The animation may have looked low budget, uh, but there were orgies and brutality and really direct commentaries on race relations from the times. Uh, it was weird seeing him without that crutch to lean on as much in Wizards. And that kind of goes to show how subversive Fritz and heavy traffic were, because Wizards isn't exactly a Pixar film. This is not Onward. Uh, this could be an example used to educate people on how much more intense the PG rating was before of July of 1984. There's Nazis and a fairy drawn like she's from a Tijuana Bible, plenty of bloody violence and war. So there's some stuff for adults in here, but it all gets warped to different degrees by the fantasy setting. And it's the fantasy, I think, that Bakshi, who, who wrote the movie, had the hardest time with for me. Some of the lowest points of this movie are just its dumb takes on plot points in a generic fantasy quest. Getting lost in the snow, trapped in a cave with a monster, or a sudden betrayal from within the core quest group. These moments that don't have that extra clever spin added that would have made them entertaining. So it feels like going through the motions a bit, like padding, even though the visuals are often very distinctive during those scenes. Highlights for me though are these moments that felt like skits. I think lots of Bakshi movies have these fun little skits, like how Fritz begins with the conservative blue-collar fathers yammering on about how today's kids are hippies. Wizards has these, and they're hilarious. A soldier who, like, feigns pacifism until another soldier assures him that they're on the winning side, and then he's gung-ho for war all of a sudden. Another soldier who uses his fallen friend as motivation to fight, but then he finds out his friend was just knocked out, and he ends up killing his friend. Or the, the bit about how useless religious institutions are during wartime. Like, there's some good ideas also that shine through in this, but they're often drowned out for me by the subpar plot beats. I liked how the banality of evil manifests in a physical way early on, with Black Wolf's armies not being able to focus long enough to win a battle, and the propaganda on film can manufacture that otherwise non-existent purpose for doing mass evil. And in the final battle, like Tim said, was great for for thought what great magic can defeat the most powerful evil person on the planet a f gun of course no matter how powerful they are if you shoot them they're dead hitler was dead again for the first five minutes of this movie though i, I really thought it was going to be another cult classic like the last unicorn that initial creative stroke of setting this after a nuclear apocalypse that faded away and then this movie slowly turned into a pretty stock Lord of the Rings ripoff, which I know chronologically is a little bit dubious to say, but still, Wizards is like a funny little movie when you consider it's a clumsy, generic fantasy story where the director tried to spice things up with Hitler. I, I would definitely recommend it to fans of animation, but not so much to fans of fantasy. As a prototype of a different movie, it's got merits. Outside of that, Wizards just didn't have enough magic for me. I completely agree, uh, by and large. Like, I feel like every time I revisit it, those failings, like the sequence with the fairies, um, always kind of grates at my nerves a little bit more. Like, and the, the the journey through the snow, it picks up a little bit more for me. I don't know, there's the, there's an attempt at characterization and like we get a little bit of relationship stuff, but the fairy stuff especially just feels like pure padding. Like everything, even the score is grating in those moments. Like just, it's Eleanor at her worst, ostensibly. Not great. Bakshi's films are frequently, I would say, though some of their parts is maybe not quite up to snuff with those parts. The Salt uh, isn't great, but there's some wonderful moments and some ideas in them. Yeah, sort of my, my overall 
bird's eye view on this is uh, it's a it's a wonderful mess. It's a it's a great train wreck, uh, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, it's like visually ma magnetic, uh, super distinct style, just a hodgepodge of quality. It just it from anim and for everything from characterization animation. It alternates between like these off kilter but really distinct cultural anthropologies, a la Tolkien, of course. You know, Bakshi was a big Tolkien fan. Uh, traditional swords and sorcery questing stuff, um, which is again probably the weakest part of it for the most part um, and goofy skits a la Fritz um, or even you know heavy traffic and coonskin coonskin sort of similarly suffers th th with this where the a plot is probably the weakest part but the rest of it is is real good fun I would argue that coonskins like highlights are a little bit stronger than wizards as a whole but the thing that really Bowie's wizards is that setting it's super distinct um, and really cool it's the kind of thing where it just feeds into the imagination like it's like you can imagine more thing there was a role-playing game based on this in the 90s too it only had a few books it was like a boutique publisher it never went anywhere but like it's a really good setting for a role-playing game also i'm fairly certain the warhammer guys probably saw this too because there's a race in that game called necrons that are like <laughs> alien terminators Ooh. yeah uh, since warhammer is sort of itself a hodgepodge of influences but back to the film proper again it's got that tone poem back and forth pacing sort of like fritz but it's completely at odds with a grand quest narrative his characters are flat and they don't really have those moments that you get in like fritz where like or heavy traffic where it's like these are broad archetypes but you get like just that one moment of really humanizing characterization all of his urban films have that and, and this one doesn't eleanor especially she's a very frustrating character back she's always been pretty weak at handling the women that populate his films why don't you sit there for a couple hours while i figure it out okay well come on let's make it avatar <laughs> But there's a lot to like. Avatar, uh, his sort of Columbo by way of Gandalf, is uh, for the most part, again, the, the Lech stuff is a little weird and off-putting, but overall he's a lot of fun. Um, as a weird protagonist, it's it's rare that you have, you know, an old man as your your brave hero. In a fantasy setting, it's always, you know, a young man, a Luke Skywalker type, that sort of thing. Uh, the battles, uh, genuinely really visceral and unique. Uh, Andrew Belling's score, um, I have a lot of affection for. It can be grating, again, like some of the chirpier stuff in the with the fair isn't great, but I think for the histories and when it needs to be a bit more somber and and set a mood um, or you know accompany the battles, I think it's very effective. The comedic sidebar stuff with the goons is great. Like you could show someone like you don't even have to show them the movie. You can show the, them those out of context. The punchline to the the religion bit where <laughs> the goons are still in the building when they blow it up. Such a morbid punchline, but it's it's really wonderful. Well, who are we looking for? Hey. <laughs> So dumb. We're looking for the priests, man, the priests. Patience, we must first observe sundown and pray. He's got a point. We need you all, Lord. We need you all, Lord. Help us! Help us! Okay, Charlie, it's no good. More than anything, though, the very idea of wizards, again, is what makes it so unforgettable. Uh, at least for me, uh, it's the, the whole concept. Like, that's what stuck with me throughout. This is the exact movie I would have made at age 13. In that it's a mess, but it's just a lot of weird ideas that, like, young men like in particular. And I'm going to say young men, mostly because of the Eleanor stuff. Like, or just young edgelords, young edgy people, young science fiction fans, uh, young swords and sorcery fans. Um, I mostly maybe highlight men because I, I also like to jokingly say this is to, you know, like, teenaged boys as the last unicorn is two teenage girls sort of as a juxtaposition i think the last unicorn is a much better movie to be clear so maybe i'm more than anything complimenting the taste of teenage girls but at the end it's uh, a messy at times awkward mashup of fantasy and dystopia uh, but uh, it still captures the imagination and doesn't really feel like anything else out there uh, at least in the world of feature animation it makes big wild swings that very often don't connect, uh, but when they do hit, they hit with the impact of an atom bomb. But speaking of the things that really hit in this movie, the thoughts on the animation and visual design of this film, which uh, Austin seems very excited to talk about and, and Tim mentioned, uh, but Austin, would you like to start us off? Uh, I've got to say right off the bat, it's so goofy that the first few shots of this with actual animation we get are so totally awkward. Just the three henchmen shuffling away like stooges told to get back in line. That was funny because the, the sort of very opening of this film is extremely striking. The sort of fisheye lens shot of the book. I was like, oh, I'm in for it. This is great. And then the Mike Plug sort of motion comic stuff set to, I think it's Susan Tyrell doing narration. That shit 
fucking ruled. I thought this movie was going to be a classic for the first five minutes. The rotoscope footage, which is probably one of the standout things of this visually, with the psychedelic backgrounds, it was cool enough. And I'm sure it would be so much cooler if I was a kid in a theater 45 years ago. Like, a lot of these 70s movies where they have those really stark changes in colors, kind of like what you think of when you think of the end of 2001, uh, I don't think those work as well on home television sets. You don't get the full picture. Because when you project a movie in an auditorium like you're supposed to, the color splashes all over the place, and the creative team's decisions make a lot more sense. It's kind of like how old video games were made to look better on CRT televisions. I think Wizards would look way better as a projection. But uh, the, the stuff in the background, though, is really impressive to me. Like the watercolors, the heavily manipulated stock footage that comes in sometimes, the unusually detailed paintings by Ian Miller. There's a couple of moments that really uh, caught my eye for goofy reasons, like the translucent dinosaur who's scared by Necron 99 in the beginning, and the skull over the moon. The skull that is superimposed over the moon and sort of loses its alignment with the moon <laughs> over time. Those were the only moments where I was just baffled. I was like, oh, that's, that's goofy. But hey, it's a really unique looking movie that undeniably had a lot of talented people working on it, and it's significantly more ambitious than Fritz and Heavy Traffic, for sure. Yeah, I I think that's uh, completely fair. There's a lot of goofiness. The, the dinosaur is the one that always really catches my attention in that opening, but the, the moon, skull moon, is a, <laughs> is a funky bit. I can attest to the fact, um, again, when I was teaching uh, Jim's class, we actually screened it in, at Webster's Winifred Moore Auditorium, which is a theater. I think it plays better on a big screen. Uh, the finale, especially. I always would hear students go actively like gasping or going like, what? Exclamations from the crowd, which is great for it. And especially like Ian Miller's backgrounds, the background designs, especially. But, Tim, your thoughts on the film's animation and visual design? Um, yeah, I mean, kind of what I alluded to earlier. Like, I think it's sort of interesting kind of mishmash of his various styles. Like, you've got the traditional stuff, you got the Rotos stuff, you got the blend of uh, interesting colors. I think that's what really makes it especially interesting is just, like, it's something you can kind of just let wash over you and just take in the visual feast of it. Uh, it's just like a vi very visually strong movie, kind of in the way that I really find like House fascinating is that it's just sort of this weird, almost experimental kind of use of visual stylings. And it's just it's very enthralling to watch. Like, I don't know how this would play for somebody who like this was their first Bakshi like I think it's a good encapsulation of his overall works but it also might be a little too much to take in all at once so I, I would be interested to like hear that perspective but like I do think it's like an interesting overall thesis on uh, Bakshi at least on his like early stylings one thing I like about House and this is that in the age of like digital movie making, you can imagine this being something you could feasibly make with the assistance of like nonlinear editing programs and digital cameras. And mm -hmm. so the fact that they went back and did it with analog technology, these superimpositions and all this crazy it's so fun to watch because it just has a different look oh, when you yeah. do it with like chemicals and these different specialized machines. It's it's fun watching them go crazy like we do now, but back in the day when it was a million times harder to go crazy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like watching the stuff with the horses running in, it's like, I, I know how I could do that now, but like looking at that as a product from 1977, like, man, that was a lot of fucking work. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, d discussing like technologies, even the way they were able to achieve like like the rotoscoped look was with um, high contrast Xerox that they painted over, which they got at a discount rate because they were like, here, we're going to show you how this can be done for animation. If you get it, give us to it for like a cent, two cents per photo. Uh, they just blew up, you know, images from, you know, stock footage. They couldn't make their own footage like they would do for Lord of the Rings. So they just used footage from newsreels, uh, Triumph of the Will, um, Alexander Nevsky, the Sergei Eisenstein film. Um, I think Sean Zulu as well as briefly employed. I think it's really good here when it's just the black color uh, opaquing and then they add on like little demon thing like demon horns and wings and, and they do a little bit of facial detailing as opposed to the um, the solarization like just ostensibly tinting a film that they'll use as a fill in for Lord of the Rings. I love that effect. Uh, let me get that out of the way. I love that effect. I love the way it clashes and uh, plays in contrast to the um, character animation. The character animation is very sort of like, like classical in a lot of ways. Um, 
bit distorted at times, but, you know, sort of seen through a crooked lens, sort of classic Disney funny animals characters and that sort of thing. But I, the contrast between that, and, you know, actual human people, actual Nazis re-rendered, filtered and altered to look like uh, demons from hell um, in probably the most on the nose possible metaphor uh, that a Jewish immigrant who grew up during wartime could possibly make about the, the dangers of fascism. But sometimes you need to be explicit with people. <laughs> but it's it's this delightful misshapen collage, the whole film. Uh, there's there's countless coloring errors and just little little problems throughout. The timing isn't quite right on a bunch. Um, they make sacrifices. I love the decision that, you know, we, we discussed previously, horses are hard to draw, so we'll just make them meatballs. Meatballs with legs. Um, <laughs> which was, is a classic thing that Bakshi had been doing for years at this point. Point in his own personal sketches. There's a lot of Bakshi touches. It's uh, if you look at his old like just drawings that he would do in his free time at uh, Terry Tunes and that sort of thing. This is you know very much informed by his visual design sensibilities. Uh, the backgrounds again, like previously mentioned, Ian Miller, uh, show stopping. Those are probably the the top ones. There's a reason he would do like official Lord of the Rings art and Warhammer 40k again, you know, amongst other things. And he's just an f- incredible artist. Um, I do want to point out uh, that. Even in Montagar, though, uh, there's some great backgrounds, those muddy watercolors and that sort of thing that you get uh, with the radiograph pen illustrations. Again, it's Ira Turek, uh, who did the line art, and uh, Johnny Vita, who did the painting. Same guys who did the wonderful backgrounds on Fritz in particular. Uh, considering the budget they were working on when they made this movie, uh, it's incredible. Uh, like, this was made for a million dollars. Star Wars was being made at the same studio for 11 million. He actually had to put in $50,000 of his own money. Yeah, he couldn't get any extra money uh, like George was able to. I thought I heard that... Um... Um, George Lucas and Ralph Bakshi went in for a meeting one time and both got denied budget increases. Lucas was able to wrangle it, um, but it was because he, he did had to cu- had to come out of his own pay, but that was how he was able to work, that he got merchandising rights. <laughs> the genius bastard. Yeah, so it was the best thing that could have happened to him, like having to take money out of his own paycheck there. But um, in particular, uh, another thing, uh, the actual character animation is uh, heavily done by uh, Herb Spence, who's a classic MGM animator, worked on Tom and Jerry, and another film which would have heavily featured rotoscoping and that sort of thing, which is Peace on Earth, uh, and it's remake Goodwill to Ben, which are these weird MGM fantasy shorts, vaguely Christmas-themed, where funny animals exist in the aftermath after humans have annihilated one another in post-apocalypse. Yeah, they're, they're fascinating early, you know, sort of films, one of which predates the Second World War, even, and, and sort of informed this movie, though I don't think Bakshi was consciously evoking them, but, you know, Spence was involved in those uh, in some capacity, you know, working at MGM. But he does he does great work. The one artist I do want to highlight, especially, uh, Brenda Banks. Brenda Banks is one of, if not the first African-American woman to work in animation. Bakshi blows smoke uh, about meeting her. Uh, he says that she started a wizard. She didn't. She started working on uh, Coonskin, actually, on an uncredited position. And she'd been an animator for uh, a couple years prior, uh, but this was her first time, you know, diving into feature animation, not television specials. And she animated the goons, like the the wide shots of the sli- slavering goons with their head bobs and everything, and these, these delightful movements. And this was a big thing for her. She would continue to work with the studio, but this was the, you know, a real showpiece opportunity for her. But she also did some great animation on Lord of the Rings, because co- contrary to popular belief, there is sections of animation in Lord of the Rings that aren't just traced. I mean, she was able to handle some of those delicate human figures in a way that would have been you know, very difficult for someone who wasn't a very accomplished Cal Arts alum. And she's great. She's incredible. Uh, she recently passed in 2020, um, and I just really wanted to spotlight her and her incredible work on the goons uh, in this film because uh, it's they're, they're just so much fun. The guys in Scorch, the monsters, are, are a huge part of this film's personality, and she is a very big part of that. And she leaves a really incredible legacy, you know, working on later Looney Tunes stuff and The Simpsons. But yeah, she just has a great, incredible legacy. And I would be remiss to not highlight her because she's under discussed and painfully little is known about her, uh, despite her being this really magnificent artist. Very last thing I want to throw in. Uh, you can tell that Ralph Bakshi went to school for cartooning. His, his films have a really three-dimensional style that you get from like, you get an anime to some extent because a lot of anime is based on comics on manga and so there's a certain three-dimensional quality Uh, there's a bit more willing to move in and out of space and that really separates it especially at a time when disney was making very flat features like robin hood uh, that were ostensibly just you know put the animated character on a stage so the animators can show off Um, and here he's doing he's trying to use every element at his disposal and the kitchen sink ostensibly to make this film Um, and i think that's part of what separates it from the pack and makes it a really distinct sort of wonderful experience and 
I'm done. I'm done talking about the film's visuals and the animators and all the cool people on it, I promise. Um, but I, I really like this film, uh, despite also being very frustrated by it. Um, and I'm glad we could discuss the, the finer points. Uh, we're going to move into general discussion, some broad ideas, uh, after this brief commercial break. We're going to be doing one thing and one thing only. Killing Nazis. Hitler was dead again. Welcome back. It is now time to generally discuss this feature. Uh, leading in, um, did you guys want to talk about just like any any moments that stood out, like stand out sort of bits uh, that we didn't get to cover in the overall discussion? There's there's one moment that I just found kind of funny. Uh, this the scene where uh, Eleanor's dad gets assassinated. I just love how the dude is just kind of chilling outside of the door for like a solid ten seconds before he shoots him. <laughs> he shoots him a lot too. That president guy rules. He's so f- weird. Oh, he's delightful. Uh, Chris Aaron, the Webster University professor, has an original drawing of him too. Um, the the line art before it was transferred to Xerox to sell. Um, it's hanging on his wall. Um, I'll, I'll have to ask him for a picture of that. Damn it, Avatar! If there's any danger, maybe we should maybe we should arm our state. Ah, there's no time for that. Enough! Bring out! I demand to know what you know, or I'll banish you. Well, I want to call Bakshi a crook. Oh. One of Bakshi's favorite pastimes around the mid 70s was spending his lunch break playing pinball at a hot dog stand on Hollywood Boulevard. And this whole movie stolen, gentlemen, right down to the title. In 1975, Bally released a tie in pinball machine based on the Ken Russell Tommy film. Look at the front of it, and you will see weird World War II imagery. Two opposing magic characters representing good and evil, and a horny love interest with protruding nipples. That machine is called Wizard. Back, she's a fraud, a hack, and I challenge him to a game of pinball. War Wizards, the original title of this movie should have been Pinball Wizards. Could have gotten the who <laughs> involved. No, uh, but on the, on the subject of theft, uh, we gotta, I guess it's good to quickly at least address the, the Von Bode, Von Bode uh, shaped elephant in the room. Avon Bode um, is a, was an independent comics artist in the 70s who was friends with Ralph Bakshi, by all accounts, um, who did a, a comic series called Cheech Wizard um, and a, a comic series called Cobalt 60 um, with sort of similar uh, science fantasy aspirations. I'm not going to say that Bakshi didn't borrow anything from those, but if you look at a lot of his fantasy illustration from his time at Terry Tunes and that sort of thing, a lot of these idea, uh, ideas are already here, uh, like his, his weird mechanical illustration and his junk town comic strip he made for himself. Cobalt 60 was almost certainly an influence for the, on the design of Peace uh, and, and some of the world stuff. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of crossover, but it's it's clearly, again, a hodgepodge of a little bit of stuff from uh, Vaughn and a little bit from Tolkien and a little bit of his old material. I, I think saying that it's, you know, a knockoff of Vaughn exclusively is, I don't know, wrong. And I feel like it kind of divorces Ralph from the fact that like, he was a filmmaker, but he, he did cartoon in his free time. He was a cartoonist. Uh, that was what he went to school for initially. Um, and he was he was a part of that community uh, just because R. Crumb doesn't like him. Does, doesn't mean that much. R. Crumb doesn't like anybody. <laughs> right. So on, on Twitter, Mark Von Bode made a post of a picture from 1977, supposedly, where George DiCaprio, known for acting in Licorice Pizza and also giving birth to Leonardo DiCaprio, or being his dad, sorry, um, put up a marquee for the L.A. premiere of Wizards, a sign that reads, Wizards, a film by Von Bode. <laughs> So, you know, that was, there was just that bit of hostility for opening day in L.A. Uh, Bakshi had to stumble into this sign accusing him of stealing the movie. And uh, I think Bakshi had the, the marquee thing taken down. But that was a little bit of drama around that uh, supposed theft that is blown out of proportion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, poor, poor Vaughn, the, the actual author of these, you know, he doesn't like... I mean, it's a shame that I guess he doesn't have the opportunity to voice his dissent uh, or not. Uh, he passed away in 75 due to an accident Whoa. from autoerotic as- asphyxiation. So I think that's part of it is people say that, you know, this guy died and then you stole all of his stuff. What the hell? Which I, again, disagree with. I don't think that was the intent. 
Um, I think Bakshi, if Bond was around, he would have worked with him. He was busy on other projects. Uh, hey, Good Looking was nearly finished before getting canned, stored away until finally getting re released in the 80s in a heavily edited form. The guy was juggling multiple film projects. I don't think he really, I don't know, had that much time to just so flagrantly <laughs> steal from someone. He was probably just throwing, again, all of his influences in as he's one to do. And he's admitted that it was inspired by Vaughn, too, after the fact, you know. Uh, so I don't know. I feel like that can be settled. Like, we can just not. <laughs> There's no reason to argue about it at this point. This so film is, is sort of based off a, off a pitch that Bakshi gave to Terry Toons, like, like a decade prior, uh, for a little fantasy called T-Wit. Again, sort of seeing him playing in the fantasy space, which would have been about uh, an elf leading his people um, to their their promised land but a bit on the nose again there but um more traditional you know kid stuff kind of but there's clearly like a comic book influence uh that's a lot of fun you know sort of later you know informing stuff for uh like spider-man and all that is it true that this film is the reason mark hamill got cast in star wars as luke skywalker that is not true. Uh, I think I think Bakshi might misspeak on the commentary. I don't think because um, he, he borrowed Mark from George because Star Wars was supposed to come out in 76. Uh, it, it did not. It was pushed back. And so it was set to come out two weeks after Ralph Bakshi's film originally titled War Wizards. So George said, hey, could you just drop the war from the title of your movie? And Ralph was like, sure, but can I borrow Mark? Because I need a voice uh, voice actor for this fairy character in my movie. And that was, you know, uh, Mark Hamill's first voice acting gig, which is probably what he's, you know, aside from uh, Luke Skywalker, of course, what he's best known for is as a vocal talent because uh, he's a very good voice actor. So sort of introduced him to that space, which is pretty cool. Nothing but respect for my Joker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, he's a good jonker. But uh, another Star Wars connection is um, early concept art of Eleanor has her as sort of a lank figure with the hair buns, a la Princess Leia. Early concept art from 75, notably, concurrent to, if not slightly predating, uh, that look for her, uh, for Princess Leia in Star Wars, which is, is interesting. Two princesses with hair buns made at the same time. Incredible. It's also a much better design than her final one in the film, <laughs> frankly. All of her earlier designs are better. Um, Star Wars is also partially why this movie failed, uh, because the part of the reason it got such a limited release was because uh, they only put it in a handful of theaters, um, and then, you know, the theaters it was in, Star Wars was a huge success, so they wanted to kind of get everything else out of the way for Star Wars to fill up more theaters. Um, so despite being a modest success, considering especially its, you know, its tiny budget, barely over a billion dollars, Christ, it could have done better than its, you know, cult hit sort of status. Such is the, the fate of Bakshi films moving forward, unfortunately. But with that, that sort of combination trivia general discussion out of the way, we'll move right into our big ending here. Final thoughts on the film. Tim. I enjoy it, warts and all. Like It definitely has issues, as we've mentioned. But again, I think it's just, it's a very interesting movie to watch as just full creativity on display. I think that um, it's the sort of thing that like more movies should aspire to have the balls that this movie has, I feel. And I think that that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, I completely agree. It's a film with a lot of sort of creative honesty and a willingness to demonstrate one man's very particular vision for how a fantasy should be done um, with all the issues and all the really cool stuff uh, that you don't get out of sort of film by committee. Austin, thoughts on the film? Even if this may be one of Bakshi's messier entries, there's still a lot to talk about. We could have done Pete's Dragon or The Rescuers, but no, we did an episode on Wizards because at the end of the day, it's far out. I think that's, yeah, it's, it's far out. It is a film that is incredibly 70s, slightly forward thinking, again, considering it's predating Star's War, but uh, also very. 70s um, in, its, uh, in its aesthetics um, and storytelling and everything. But um, it's a hodgepodge mess. I, I don't think I can disagree with you guys on that front, um, but I still love it. There's still a part of me that's, you know, 12 watching this for the first time and is like, yeah, yeah, hooting and or hollering, uh, banging my fists against the table, waking my <laughs> parents up. I didn't actually do all that, but I did it in my mind. On the inside, I'm hooting. On the outside, I'm hollering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just the the world of it, the visuals, the the artists. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, like, learning about Brenda Banks was sort of like a learning about Reiko Okuyama thing uh, for me. You know, two very significant artists in my my interest in like animation studies stuff uh, in general. 
and so just the rebounding effect this had on me, uh, particularly as a young person, because I, I watched anime at the time, and it was like, here is an, an adult sort of fantasy film that's not super adult, like Heavy Traffic, and it, but it's not like completely crass, like South Park. It, it aspires to something kind of artful in its fantasy, and it's made in America. You know, it's not anime, uh, which was like, you, you can do that. And it sort of opened up a lot of doors for me. So um, I, I will always appreciate it for that. I'll always have a lot of fun revisiting it. But that's Wizards. That's our thoughts on this Bakshi classic, uh, this delightful train wreck. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, all you uh, mutants out there. If you're watching this on YouTube and enjoyed it, uh, be sure to give us a like and or subscribe. Uh, we always appreciate those a ton. Uh, leave us a comment uh, on like, what's your favorite Bakshi movie? Did you like Wizards? Um, do you think that uh, Bakshi's a hack for stealing everything from underground cartoonists? Uh, you, do you want to clip that out of context? and make me look like a fraud. Uh, if you're listening on a <laughs> podcast platform, uh, especially Spotify, Apple, etc., uh, A, hope you enjoyed all the curse words. I don't think we really had any in this episode, but, you know, a few of them. And just be sure to give us a positive review, five stars, uh, etc., depending on your podcatcher of choice. Um, and if you really like our stuff, be sure to check out our Patreon. Uh, give us some money to feed a hungry Austin. He deserves it. He works He works too hard on these, uh, making them exceptionally good, uh, despite my best efforts to sabotage him next week. Uh, tune in as we discuss a very different, uh, infinitely less cool Ralph uh, with Disney's gamer-targeted feature, Wreck-It Ralph. See you then, gamers. Hitler is dead again. <laughs> My body is crawling with hell. <laughs> Damn it, Avatar! I slid my ticket across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.